In today's live interview, we're going to be talking about a story, telling a story of corporate greed, corporate corruption, patient abuse, in my opinion, uh, uh, patient uh, medical rape. I don't know how else to put it. Basically, uh, dialysis patients are trapped in a system. They have no say-so. And if they try to have say-so, they can be banned. Uh, a dialysis patient will die within days to weeks without dialysis. And so they're well aware that their dialysis clinic will kick them out. And then that's a death sentence if they speak up too loudly and complain uh, too loudly. And so I have the great honor today of interviewing uh, Dr. Muller. Welcome, doctor. It's glad to have you here. Thank you very much, Dr. Barry. It's great to be here. So Dr. Muller is the author of this book. Where is that? There it is right there. Yes. How to make a killing. And I've, I've listened to this book. I have not read it, just full disclosure. I've listened to it twice, and both times it, it uh, made me sad and furious at the same time. So welcome, Dr. Muller. Uh, you are an investigative reporter, uh, PhD, and you've got a couple of other books uh, that, along the same line, but this is the book that I really want people to focus on. So if you know someone who has, who's on dialysis, a family who goes through this, then 100% they need to read this book. But I think it, it appeals to a broader audience because just the model of corporate greed and the model of how corporations not only capture customers, but capture the federal government uh, in the process <clears throat> and have a direct insight on how legislation is written. I think this book contains all that and more. And so I highly, highly recommend it. Welcome, Dr. Muller. Uh, what, what, how did dialysis get on your radar? How did this come about? Yeah, it's very, it's, it's strange. I, I, I actually was like a lot of people who uh, had knew nothing about dialysis, knew nothing about those strange, uh, you know, pastel facades in the, in the in industrial parks and malls that I passed by. I knew not, nothing about what was going behind. I, I was writing a book about whistleblowing and one of the, uh, you know, the usual suspects, banks and national security and defense companies and, and uh, big pharma. And one of the um, categories was big dialysis. Um, I had no idea what that industry was about, but I was amazed at the number of whistleblower lawsuits and huge settlements to the tune of 400, 500 million a pop uh, that they were writing, um, settling um, accusations of serious wrongdoing and going on their merry way. Their stock price was still going up. And I was fascinated by the kind of the corporate culture of these, uh, of one company in particular, Davida, which kind of styled, it seemed to style itself almost as a cult. I mean, you had to cross a bridge to join and they had these big jamborees where they'd do synchronized dancing and uh, skits, funny skits where they'd play, kill federal prosecutors, this sort of thing. And, you know, I, I had formerly worked in investment banking and I'm kind of interested in the corporate culture side of things. So that's how I got introduced to dialysis and, and the amount of money sloshing around in the industry really caught my attention. Then I talked with caregivers, the dialysis uh, nurses and techs and nephrologists, of course. And then I talked with patients. And at that point, I was no longer uh, a sort of a, an impartial bystander observing something. I was in the thick of a really unacceptable, in my view, unacceptable situation. I should say that a number of companies, when I submitted my, before publication, submitted my comments that I was going to write in my book uh, for their um, review, they strongly disagreed with my findings. Um, and I nevertheless stand by my reporting. I included some of their comments in my book for, for fairness, but I stand by my six years of reporting and research. I stand by my 200 and well, 200 odd pages of writing and 60 pages of endnotes, which you would not have seen uh, or heard in the, in the, uh, mercifully in the audio book, but they're there in the printed edition. And so, um, I'm just going to put it to the to the readers to make their own decisions. This is my position, and I stand by my reporting. But um, read the book and, and draw your own conclusion. Anyway, um, my findings are that in a lot of in big dialysis, and we're talking about Fresenius and Davida, the two multinational corporations that dominate 80% of the market. 
Um, many of these, um, you know, uh, out, outpatient clinics that they run, often in strip mar malls and industrial parks, um, there's a style of dialysis that's fast throughput. I mean, uh, these, these uh, I've heard people call these uh, clinics um, Jiffy Lubes, um, and uh, they talk about cattle call dialysis, processing as many p patients as possible. Um, and, and that means short treatment times and high ultrafiltration rate. Um, now, I should say, obviously, each clinic is different. This is not true of all clinics, and it's not true of all clinics in Davida and Fresenius, and it's certainly not true of all clinics in other companies. But in many cases, this is happening. And other things happen, especially to the less profitable um, publicly insured Medicare, Medicaid patients. Um, as you mentioned, if if uh, in some cases, and, and, and it happened, I, I encountered it many times in my reporting, if people raise their hand and complain um, uh, about the quality of their care, I had one registered nurse who was also a dialysis patient who saw someone about to cannulate her and who hadn't washed their hands. And even I know, and I, my, my doctor is not a medical degree, but even I know that's, I mean, when you're inserting a 12 gauge needle into someone's major artery uh, it, it, or, or fistula, um, it, it, you better wash your hands. And yep. not only result, because anytime you're entering the vascular tree, you should wash your hands, but also this patient has a foreign body, the, the cannula in the fistula, which is a nidus for chronic uh, infection. And so all the more reason. And so you're saying this, this, lady who was a retired registered nurse said to the dialysis tech, Hey, you didn't wash your hands. You should wash your hands before you put something in the foreign body that's inside my vascular tree. And what was the outcome of, of that? That very rare. I mean, that's a very reasonable, rational request. I would say as a doctor. Like, yeah. So what was the outcome of that? The outcome of that was that she became persona non grata. One of those patients that complains, or who do you think you are telling me how to do my job? Um, and, you know, the fact is that dialysis patients are the ultimate vulnerable patient. As you pointed out at the beginning, Dr. Barry, if you, they don't come in you know, a minimum a three times a week for three hours in a session, and we'll, we'll talk about that later, should be longer um, on average, um, they're going to die. They're going to die in a short time. So and it won't be they, a pleasant death. It will not be pleasant. Uh, no, uh, it doesn't. It doesn't sound to me like uh, a, 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 I mean. I have to say, dialysis is so bad in many cases that the way in which the, the symptoms that are created by bad dialysis, um, fast and high throughput dialysis, are so awful that some people decide to end it, to stop yep. dialysis yep. voluntarily. Um, but let's, others, let's talk about that. In the first part of this book, you go deep into the science and the science mm -hmm. history of dialysis. And I, abs I love that part as a, as a medical nerd. I learned so many things about the development of dialysis. And but the, the main takeaway was is that it's well established in the scientific literature, in the medical literature, that's that slow, long dialysis works much better, is less, it causes far fewer symptoms in the patient. But when dialysis has been set up on basically a fast food model of get them in, get them out. Uh, the more patients we see a day, the higher our profit. Then what you wind up with is, is clinics trying to get the dialysis done in two hours, three hours, four hours, instead of the eight to 10 hours that it should take. And, and quite, quite honestly, can be done at home the, the vast majority of the time. But think about it. If McDonald's said, hey, you know, it's actually healthier for you if you would just stay home and cook. Rather than come eat at McDonald's, you can understand that would that would impact their profits. And that CEO who said that out loud would be quickly fired by the board of directors. The same thing is going on in dialysis because they're following a fast food model. They have to have a line of patients at the door. They have to have constant crank, get them in, get them out, which leads to things like techs not wanting to wash their hands, techs reusing equipment, techs doing all the cutting corners, basically trying to hit corp corporate goals the patients are suffering from this and i can remember as a as a as a, a first year medical student back in 1996 you would see a dialysis clinic in a, a medium to large city 
And now literally every small town in the United States has at least one, often two dialysis clinics. And we'll get into later how, how their, the remuneration is such that, and how the federal government's involved in this, that uh, it, that's what's causing that to happen. But how is it that we know that long and slow dialysis, uh, usually at home, how do we know that's better? How, how is it possible that we do know that's better, yet we're doing this ultra high filtration rate in the clinics and churning these people in and out? How is that even possible? Because these clinics are run by doctors, nephrologists who read the literature. So how are they able to ignore what's obviously in the medical literature? That's a very good question. Uh, at the end of the day, you're absolutely right that the doctor still controls, the patient still holds the prescription pad. And at the end of the day, uh, it is that doctor's signature on the prescription that determines how long the treatment is, how, how high filtration it's gonna be. Having said that, if you work for a big company and you have a corporate treatment protocol, the, um, and, and there's a lot of pressure to stick to it, um, and deviations, as you pointed out, in fast food, as in fast dialysis, are not welcome. Um, it's I, I, I interviewed several nephrologists um, who were who were gutsy enough to speak on the record with their own name, um, describing the kind of pushback they got from big companies when they tried to prescribe individualized medicine for their heaven forbid individualized medicine for their patients. So the idea is, at the end of the day, that profits have supplanted patient care or profits come first patient care comes second they, they don't actually you know actively want these patients to die as far as i know um but but profits come first and they're very open about this i mean in their annual reports and their communications with wall street and so on they're very straightforward about this look this is shareholder value that that is our that is our aim here um and and you know I frankly the the, the government and in particular CMS um, which should be riding much tighter herd on this industry than it is 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 largely to blame and it's to blame because I mean um, uh, I think that the um, regulatory system is is badly uh, captured badly broken we're not getting serious regulation in this industry because you have these two giants who kind of you know um a lot of the regulators have worked for or will work for these giants and that's not a good situation but ultimately cms in the very metrics that it has set up the very hoops that it is set up for these uh, corporations to jump through in their dialysis treatments like length of treatment time like ufr they're not even measuring that right. they're not even measuring that so the government's right. plan itself is is not demanding proper dialysis. And that's who pays the bills is the is the federal government. So let, just to give uh, viewers a kind of a, a feel for just how big a deal this is, uh, DaVita has over 2,900 clinics in the United States. They take care of over 225,000 patients. Fresenius has 4,100 clinics over that in the United States, and they take care of over 345,000 patients. Now, DaVita, back in 2022, they, they clocked in at $11.6 billion in profits in 2022. Uh, for Cineas, $19.4 billion in profit. And let's be very clear, when we say profit, we're at least 98% of their income comes from the federal government. Because here's the thing that a lot of people don't know, and it's, this is going to surprise some people. Dialysis is socialized medicine. It is the only part of medicine in the United States that is 100% socialized, meaning all their money comes from the federal government. Very, very. There's probably a few ultra wealthy people who have a, a sweetheart deal with the dialysis clinic so they can get what they actually want and need. But the average person, the CMS, uh, Medicare, is pay us a little subset of the CMS that's dedicated to chronic kidney disease. They pay all the bills. How did that come to be? Uh, that's a fascinating story in and of itself. It, it, it really is. And it, and it takes us back to a time in the early 70s where, uh, and this really dates it, where the Republicans, the Democrats, the insurance companies, the AMA, everybody had a viable and um, uh, you know, executable plan for national health. Everybody thought we are going to do what every other developed country in the, in the world uh, has done. We're going to make a national health plan. And um, dialysis was considered 
the first step um, in in a rapid um, you know rolling out of this plan. Uh, and, and the reason that it was so urgent is because it was the first time well, was the first vital organ replaced to be replaced by a machine. Um, and it was done quite rapidly after the war and, and wartime uh, creative geniuses started to create these machines, but they were kind of um, um, perfected and, and the axis, uh, the fistula was, was, was invented in the early and mid sixties. And all of a sudden this became a viable treatment and people who were condemned to, I mean, kidney failure patients before were, were dead. All, the, the only thing the doctor would say was, you know, go home, get comfortable and, and your time will come very soon in the matter of days. And, uh, so in, in a combination of different places around the country, Cleveland Clinic and, and um, uh, in Boston at, um, at the Brigham and at University of Washington uh, under um, Belding Scribner's care, Dr. Belding Scribner's care, a series of ex um, you know, centers of excellence created this treatment, but there were only a few centers of excellence and a lot of people started to form a, a line at the door. Um, and, and their reaction to this, at least in, in Seattle, was rather dramatic. They said, okay, we're going to set up a panel, um, a banker, a lawyer, and all non-medical except for one non-nephrologist, um, um, a housewife, as they used to call them, uh, and, and, and a, cl a cleric would sit down and go through anonymized files of the different patients who were applying for treatment. And, uh, you know, the ones that got in, survived and sometimes survived for decades. The ones that didn't <clears throat> died within days. And, and this got the attention first of the press and then of Congress. And so Congress said, um, after, after a New York uh, salesman um, dialyzed on the floor of the House Ways and Means Committee, which takes a certain amount of chutzpah, uh, it really got Congress's attention. And they agreed to pay for this miraculous but very, very expensive uh, breakthrough medicine. I mean, you know, there have been breakthrough medicines like polio vaccine and and so on, but but those have been cheap and easy to roll out. This was high tech, and and very expensive. And really, this is the beginning of our quandary with very expensive high tech medicine, both who gets it and who pays for it. And yep. at this point, Congress said, right, the American government should be paying for this. This is a direct threat to the American dream, um, and we should be taking care of this. And uh, and that's what they did. They 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 included in the brand new Social Security Act, um, you know, legislation so that the people with kidney failure um, would be treated either with transplant or with um, with dialysis, and the U.S. government paying the bulk of the of the costs. So yeah. that's and let's be very clear here, Doctor Mueller. The technology, the invention, the the innovation is almost magical. It it, it reminds me a lot of the story of of the invention of insulin like it, yeah. it literally these people had a, they had a death sentence there was no option that was it they were dead within days to weeks and all of a sudden now thanks to scientific breakthroughs thanks to the work of diligent doctors and pmds and phds there's all there's suddenly an option here where i don't have to die and not only that if the dialysis is done properly i can lead a pretty darn happy, normal, healthy, comfortable life. And so the we have, Dr. Mueller and I have no problem with the science of dialysis. Hmm. If done properly, it's, it's, it's almost miraculous. But the problem comes in the way it's administered by the corporations and the way it's paid for by the federal government. So the CMS through the, the end-stage renal disease little subgroup, they pay all the bills for the vast majority of patients. Now, is this the same kind of Medicare deal? Like if I see a Medicare patient, I might charge $75 for whatever I did as their doctor, and then I'll get a check from, from Medicare for $37. Is it is it kind of that same model where Medicare really discounts what they pay? And, and so it doesn't matter what you ask for, what it actually costs, they're just going to pay you what they get? Or does dialysis clinics, do they have some sort of a sweetheart deal with the federal government? There, there is no, as far as I know, no particular sweetheart deal. Um, there have been come and gone sweetheart deals where the differential between their reimbursement rate and the rate that they were charged by, say, Amgen for EPO was huge. And so they make a, a killing um, off of that. That has been uh, that, that has gone away. I mean, the payment model right now, it seems to be, from, from my point of view, for CMS to lowball as low as possible. Um, and it's cost cutting mode. Um, so 250 bucks. Is their is their bundle, 
and and you better make that work. Now, um, there are problems. You mentioned home dialysis. That is an absolutely critical part. That is an absolutely critical part of proper dialysis treatment. It was right from the beginning recognized and part of Congress's you know, vision for, for treatment that people would be treating at home, take cr- control to the extent that they could of their own disease and, um, and return to the workforce and become taxpayers again. And, yeah. you know, uh, and, and the vast majority of people who are being dialyzed, you know, high throughput like, like McDonald's, uh, they're too sick. To work, um, they have no control over their schedule. Uh, they they tr- do the travel time and then waiting time and recovery time. So it's just that you know the vision of Congress has gone there. Um, but yeah, I I um, the, the 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 fact is that the that the big companies and and all dialysis companies make vastly more money on private insured patients um, than they do off of Medicare. I, I mean, the big companies actually claim that they lose money on Medicare patients. I don't believe that. I mean, these folks are not in the business of losing money. Um, But but there's certainly I mean, it's three three and 10 times more profitable to treat a privately insured patient. And so that's where you get this pernicious two uh, tier model where the privately insured patients are your sweetheart and they really are worth 10 times more in some cases than than these other folks. And so guess who gets the, the kid glove treatment? Guess who gets the shift that they want? Guess who doesn't get shown the door if they act out? It's not the publicly, it's not the Medicare and Medicaid, it's those privately insured uh, folks. And and time and again in my reporting, I talk with people who said, boy, you know, when I shifted from, from private to public insurance, my world changed. All of a sudden, I didn't feel like I was I was welcome here anymore. Uh, and that's just not a situation. That, that 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 should work. And it's partly the fault of the corporations, but it's partly the par- fault of the federal government and CMS in particular, setting up pernicious, um, you know, um, incentives, perverse incentives um, towards a certain kind of treatment um, uh, that ultimately is the fast food model. Yep. And I love that you use the term perverse incentives, because I think that's exactly what happens when big corporations and government get too tidy, get too comfortable together and uh, go to too many lunches or dinners or stay, you know, that together you have yeah. these perverse incentives. And so with the, the scientific literature showing very clearly that long and slow dialysis is the best way. And so I would guess from what you're saying that somebody with private insurance probably gets a little slower uh, dialysis in the, in the clinics. And then when they lose their private insurance and go to you know, Medicare, Medicaid, all of a sudden they're speeding up their dialysis. Did you see any indication of that in your research? To, to be honest with you, I didn't, um, because the fact is that um, patients, public or private, generally speaking, as far as I can tell, are treated on the same model in that they want them in and out as fast as possible. Um, it's and, and ironically, although long, slow, gentle dialysis is vastly healthier and 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 the, the opposite, the fast bazooka dialysis, as some doctors call it, is deadly. Uh, and part of the reason why Americans on dialysis die two to three times sooner than patients in other uh, developed countries, which might make you think about it, um, it you know, it creates these symptoms um, that are so awful, um, terrible cramping, terrible headaches, uh, dialysis fog, they call, you know, um, and, and not to mention coronary arrest, um, the serious symptoms that cause a horrible quality of life. And, and patients when offered, um, and, and often they are offered, when they're offered a longer treatment, they deny it. They, re- they say, good Lord, no, what would make me want to do this longer? And, and sadly, they, they aren't corrected and they aren't told, well, look, <laughs> if we do it shorter, it's going to shorten your life. How do you feel about that? Um, and increase but, the but, but, Precisely. And that's the sad thing is that they think that by shortening their their dialysis, they're they're going to get a, get away without those terrible symptoms. But in fact, they're accentuating the symptoms. Yep. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, you're watching a replay. This has actually been recorded live in front of our private community. And one of the many benefits of being in our community is you get to ask questions directly to the experts that I interview. So Dr. Muller, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll take a question occasionally from our private community. Is that okay? 
That's I terrific. In fact, yeah. I really, really welcome that. Um, okay, beautiful. I, Ashley, I, Ashley says, does chronic kidney disease still qualify for Medicare cover, coverage regardless of age? Um, it's regardless of age, but it's end stage renal disease. So it's when your kidneys pack up that, yeah. that you are covered. Um, after after a, a, a period of time, you are automatically covered by Medicare or Medicaid or TRICARE, a government program. Right. And it's when your degree of kidney failure reaches a certain point, which is determined by various calculations of kidney function. That's when uh, it basically triggers, OK, you've got end stage uh, renal disease enough to qualify for dialysis. And uh, uh, one of my biggest problems with Davida and, and Fresenius, I'm going to uh, show their websites here in a second, is that. Also, it's well known in the medical literature that for somebody with chronic kidney disease, they need to be eating a low carb diet mm. that protects kidney function. There's this huge myth out there that too much protein or too much animal protein actually harms your kidneys. And, and when you look into the research about that, that's completely false. It's a total myth. It, nobody even knows where it came from. The truth of the matter is, is that the lower carbohydrate diet you eat, the more you protect remaining kidney function. And we've actually seen people with stage one, two, three, even stage four chronic kidney disease improve their kidney function by not eating all the sugar and the highly processed grains and eating more low carb whole foods. I've seen stage three CKD, which is still two steps from needing dialysis. I've seen that go back to stage one. I've seen stage two go back to normal kidney function but you have to be eating a low carb diet for that to happen. And uh, when I show the websites, uh, I, it's going to piss some people off to see what these guys are recommending. They actually have recipes on the website. Like here, you, here's a great recipe, kidney friendly, protect your kidneys by eating this recipe. And in my mind, that's the height of conspiracy. You're recommending recipes to people with pre-existing kidney disease. That is guaranteed to make their kidney disease worse quickly so that they'll need dialysis sooner. That's exactly what these recipes are doing. Uh, you've seen lots of evidence of this kind of behavior. Um, a lot of people call this soft crime or soft conspiracy. It's not like the CEO of DeVita is in the, in the dialysis cl clinic hitting people with a hatchet. That's not, that's not the crime we're talking about. This is very subtle uh, white collar, hands off, you know, kid glove crime. Uh, talk about some of the judgments that have been in, in the courts that have come against Davida and, Fres and Fresenius in recent years uh, and, and how what kind of checks they had to write for their crime. Yeah, well, first of all, you should we should say that these were all allegations and that they were settled out of uh, settled um, legally um, yes. with all parties. And so technically nothing has gone wrong. Um, they they have bought the right, as, at least in my interpretation, to say they were innocent. And the government has bought the right to say they won the case. Uh, and, and in fact, that's not justice at all. But in any case, these these allegations um, include things like Medicare fraud, kickbacks to doctors, to uh, to in, in incentivize um, referral of patients to clinics, um, foreign corrupt practices acts violations, uh, unnecessary vascular surgeries, and the list goes on and on and on. And and Dr. Barry, I mean, we're talking in some cases settlements on the order of uh, five hundred million dollars. Um, uh, you know, it, it, uh, <laughs> there are there are, well the EPO. Uh, thing alone in Texas alone was $50 million. If you extrapolate that out to the rest of the country, and that was never done um, by the federal government, then you'll get a very big number. This, these are things that I learned while I was working on the whistleblower side of, 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 of this and the lawsuits against the big dialysis corporations. Um, and, you know, that again, uh, comes to, for, at the end of the day, assuming that these charges were correct when this is an assumption they you know they were settled and therefore technically they're not but assume they were and if you read the complaints they're pretty detailed pretty interesting uh uh and you talk to the complainants uh and the uh the relators the whistleblowers they have some good data regardless um at the end of the day if you allow corporations to simply write a big check and this is in big pharma and this is medical devices and uh, sometimes in the billions of dollars and Everybody walks away with a, with jingling pockets and nothing changes. And the only people who aren't at that table are the patients. 
They are not sitting at the table. They don't the partake. Are the loser. Yeah, they're the loser. And very often what I've found is that the, the judgments or the, the agreements, yes, we'll write a check for this much. To regular people like you and I, it sounds like a huge number. Oh, my God, how many million? But to these billion dollar corporations, it's it's not even a slap on the wrist. It's it's basically they consider this just the cost of doing business. Every now and then you're going to have to write a check like that. They figure it into their budgets for coming years. Uh, they have bean counters that say, OK, we can get away, get away with this because the most we're probably going to have to write a check for is this amount. And but we're going to make 10x that much by cutting this corner or that corner. These are literal conversations that are happening in corporations like this every single day. Oh, we can we can save, you know, 100 million a year. And the most, the biggest the check's going to be is maybe 10 million. Uh, yeah, obviously, that's a net win for the corporation. So they're going to do that. Um, you mentioned epigen. So this is a, a synthetic erythropoietin, which is a, is a, is a, a chemical that the kidneys secrete that encourage bone marrow to make red blood cells, which carry oxygen and do lots of other things. My, my listeners know about red blood cells. We, we talk about those a lot. Uh, epigen is not erythropoietin. It is a, uh, a patented molecule that acts like erythropoietin, but it's not actually that. You can't get a patent on an actually naturally occurring molecule. Let's talk about the epigen fiasco uh, I, that, that happened with these two big companies. Well, again, it's one of these situations where if you set up the incentives wrong, you can predict with 100 percent certainty how things are going to play when you have a completely for profit model and shareholder value ultimately trumps patient care. Well, EPO came along, uh, I believe it was 1989, uh, Amgen invented it and 1991 uh, Medicare decided that they were going to pay for it and they decided to pay for it in a way that produced a very perverse incentive in that. Um, every dose of EPO, every ounce of EPO, every CC of EPO that you uh, used, you being a big uh, dialysis company, but also um, oncology and, and, and other uses, uh, you would make money because you're, um, again, the, the rate at which Medicare was reimbursing you for that drug was higher than the rate you were paying to Amgen uh, to purchase the drug. So uh, I'll let you guess, uh, Dr. Bro, you know better than I do what happened. I'll let our listeners guess what happened next to the usage of EPO. It went through the roof, through surprise, the roof. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. Um, and everybody and, needed epigen just magically. All of a sudden, every patient needed epigen. Yeah. And Amgen was promising that it would improve your sex life and it would improve your quality of everything. I mean, they, they, the, the, the promises on the packages. Now, I mean, as again, I, I don't mean to preach to the choir. EPO is a very good thing, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, in, in, within, within reasonable amounts. But as the clinical trials started to roll in and show that beyond a reasonable amount, you were killing people or at least putting, putting their, heart, uh, their heart, their vascular system in, in jeopardy. Um, and, and a big EPO trial was halted because uh, it was the, the control group was in so much more danger. Um, so uh, as this as this news started to gather and as the FDA started to finally apply black box warnings and so on to EPO, um, uh, the corporations were still using very large, very much higher doses of, of epigen. And that only stopped. Uh, and, and they were claiming and the CEOs were claiming in their uh, public um, statements. No, no, no. We're, we're just doing what the doctor's orders. You know, this is purely for the the health of the patient. That's our only parameter. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, con Congress started to, to look into this and, and there were some lawsuits. And finally, in January 2011, after EPO had become the single largest drug expenditure in all of Medicare, <laughs> one drug, EPO, that was it. Um, in January 2011, uh, Medicare uh, bundled EPO into the payment process of dialysis. In, in, in plain English, they made, they turned EPO from a, from a profit center into a cost. Yep. So now instead of being paid for every CC of EPO, after a certain amount, you are paying for that EPO. And I will and, again, uh, again uh, let's let the, the viewers guess what <laughs> happened to the, how much EPOGEN was being used when that changed. 
What do you think? You, you they use more or they use less magically immediately when the new guidelines went into effect? Uh, don't don't keep us in suspense, Doctor Muller. Tell us. Well, it, magically they cut. Uh, uh, you know, Fresenius cut almost thirty percent in one year. That same year, and Davida forty seven percent. Almost so almost halved the amount of EPO that they were to such an extent that at least according to the US RDS uh, database, there was a spike in um, hospitalizations, in transfusions, in things where people were suddenly taken off of EPO, the EPO that their bodies had become used to so fast that it caused harm. So you tell me, I mean, it's a classic example of, of perverse financial incentives creating a business model that um, ultimately you know, um, <laughs> drastically um, affects patient care. And it's partly the corporations that are doing this, but it's also part, partly the paymasters, uh, you know, and, and Medicare um, who yeah. are who are not paying attention or perhaps uh, not enforcing uh, the regulation. Yeah. Let's tell you, let's talk about CMS, Medicare, Medicaid. How, how in the world do we we know all these facts about dialysis? That longer and slower is better. That home dialysis is better. Uh, the federal government is putting the bill for the vast majority of dialysis care in the United States. They they have they ha are they just not aware of the research? Are they not aware of the suffering that happens to patients when you do the bazooka dialysis? Get them in and out through the McDonald's model. Or, as I would guess, that uh, DeVita and Fresenius have lots of well-paid lobbyists in Washington. That's just a wild conspiratorial guess on my part. Uh, and that, that lots of congressmen and senators get taken to nice dinners and talked to and cajoled. I, wouldn't, I would not be surprised if DeVita and Fresenius actually write some of the uh, legislation that gets passed verbatim. Uh, seeing as how that happens in other, uh, you know, areas of business, that very often happens. What, what did you find when you looked into the federal government, CMS, Medicare, Medicaid? No, exactly. I mean, part of it is capture. Um, part of the problem here is that the big corporations are very powerful. They have a lot of lobbyists. They have a lot of political. Dr. Mueller seems to be locked up. Hopefully he'll come back around in a second. Doc, I've lost you. You're frozen on my screen. I'm going to take this opportunity. What you may want to do is just close out and then come back in with that. So, oh, wait, maybe you're back. Are you there? I, I'm, I'm back now. Should I start okay. again? Or, or Yeah, yeah. Start. Answer that question again because you locked up there for a second. OK. Um, yeah, part of the problem here is certainly in uh, regulatory capture. I mean, these big corporations have huge lobbying teams. They're very well capitalized. They spend a lot of money on, on you know, getting their word out. Um, but it's partly also, I think, the determined cost cutting mentality of CMS. They really do want to minimize costs. Uh, one person and this is not in my book and this is something that was completely um, said not not a, as part of an official conversation, but I, I heard it and then I started seeing the symptoms. This person who worked at CMS said, said uh, in a sort of an unguarded moment, do you really think we want those people to stay, to live longer? That's a huge cost. Sure. And if you're thinking in terms of minimizing costs, um, then, then, you know, the, those every year that a dialysis patient survives is another year you have to pay for them. Now, right. that's a very short sighted way of looking at it, because if you did it right, if you did home dialysis, if you did preventative medicine, if you kept people on their kidneys, if you use the, you know, the, the miracle new GLP-1 um, uh, agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors and so on, if you did preventative medicine, you'd save a ton of money. Uh, you'd save way more money than if than if you shorten, you know. But at the end of the day, CMS is not measuring the key indices. We've talked about uh, duration of treatment. We've talked about ultrafiltration rate. We we haven't mentioned, but we should mention blood pump speed, um, blood flow rate, I should say, uh, water quality, uh, myopic focus on KTORE, which is a measurement of urea, 
whereas there are scores of molecules that are, are more toxic and more, you know, middle molecules, more serious to take into account. All of these things CMS is and is not doing. And that right. creates um, that creates a perfect storm for the patients because at the end of the day, the corporations are making as much money as they can and they're doing what they're doing. But CMS is, frankly, I think they're sort of silent partner in, in this. And, and at the end of the day, patients lose, but also workers lose. And this is something I really want to stress that so many of the people I interviewed in, in for my book were dialysis workers with a heart of gold, with absolutely rigorous ethics, who were who were being burned out, who were, who were suffering moral trauma from the conditions of their workplace. They were doing the best they could for their patients, they are doing the best they could for their patients. Yep. But in a fast food model, when the, when the bean counters are telling you how to, how to do medicine, uh, you're going to suffer if you're a, if you're a healer. And, and that's so many people have said, well, wait, you should have talked about, you know, the good clinics. And there are good clinics out there and there are great clinics and there are great workers. I want to just hat tip to all those people out there. But I think they, too, are to, to a lesser extent, but still victims of this fast food model. Yeah. And there's 7000 uh, more than 7000 dialysis clinics in the United States alone. Uh, I would encourage if anybody watching this, if you have a, a friend or a relative who is a dialysis nurse, a dialysis tech, works at a dialysis clinic, I would recommend Dr. Mueller's book to them because I'll guarantee you, Dr. Mueller, the average <clears throat> nurse or tech that works in a dialysis clinic, they're absolutely ethical and moral. They absolutely want to do the best thing for the patients but they are given these guidelines by the corporation, right? And they have to follow those guidelines or they'll be fired. They'll be, you know, punished and fired. But I guarantee you the majority of techs and nurses do not know that there is a much better way to do dialysis, not for corporate profit, but for the health and the comfort of the patient. And I think any nurse or dialysis tech, uh, when if they read your book, How to Make a Killing, they would be quickly faced with an ethical question. Am, am I really, am, I want to help patients. Every nurse wants to help patients. Every doctor, every tech, I bet there's nephrologists at work that, that have, they're lazy. They have not read the, the literature. They don't know that long and slow is better. They don't, they don't really understand that KT over B, that's not the best measure of uh, success in dialysis. They think that, that, you know, bazooka dialysis is just as safe and just as comfortable. They just don't know the truth. And so I, I recommend anybody, if you have a, a friend or relative working in a dialysis clinic, ask them to read this book because they're basically uh, unconsciously complicit in how these patients are being treated while trying to do the right thing. Um, Let's talk about KT over B. So this, this is a measure that they use. Uh, go into some details about this and, and tell us what, what does that miss when you just go by KT over B? What are you missing? What are the other markers that could be used? Yeah, K KT over B is, um, it's, it's uh, urea. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, the speed at which urea is removed from the blood, basically. And, and um, it's, it's abundant in the bloodstream. It's easily measured. And it models the behavior of other bloodstream toxins during dialysis. That I mean, that's that's the assumption that if you measure urea clearance, you're measuring how well you're doing in clearing right. all these other um, <clears throat> molecules. The problem is that urea is water soluble, and so it's easy to dialyze away, relatively easy to swiftly get rid of it, um, and and it's not representative of a bunch of other small solu solutes. And we're talking phosphate and parathyroid hormone and phenols and indols and other things. And uh, nor does it accurately model middle molecule um, um, substances. It doesn't model um, protein based uh, substances. And, and it leads to this, this kind of um, tunnel vision about if I get sufficient adequate is this terrible word that is used KT over clearance if i hit that number i'm done we can turn the machine off um 
<laughs> you know, it, it, it's it that's not um, the, the be all and the end all of of dialysis quality, but it has become the be all and the end all. And I'll and I'll give one reason why it's darn easy to measure one number. Um, it's easy to do it fast um, and it works well with a corporate fast throughput treatment model. Um, and again, I think the, the 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 medical community and the corporate community have have been you know, the medical community has been shaped in many ways by the corporate community, given the power of these the corporations. Um, and, and therefore, the definition of success in dialysis has to some extent been set. Um, I mean, obviously, Edmund Lowry and others who were uh, uh, in, involved in the groundbreaking determination of KT over V, um, that were wonderful scientists, no question. Uh, Edmund Lowry also worked for National Medical Care, which is one of the great big corporations that became uh, was bought by Fresenius. But, um, the, the, you know, there is, uh, at the time, it was useful to put, a, uh, put up some sort of um, measures uh, for baseline benchmark measures for how well we're doing here. But rapidly, KT over V became the, the only measure of quality and dialysis. And that's a disastrous mistake. Another issue is fluid removal. I mean, many People who work in dialysis don't understand the important, the vital importance of not, as they say, as some people say, ripping off all the fluid in one go. And that's ultrafiltration rate. Um, if you bump up that ultrafiltration rate, you are going to cause serious harm, organ stunning. Um, you know, it, it, the, the list of harms is, is, is incredible and widely understood, but, but not if you're working in this, in this mentality where, OK, here's how you do it. Uh, and here's the here's the uh, um, the manual and turn the crank and and process as many widgets as you can. It does fit this sort of fast food mentality, but people are not burritos. No, I totally agree. And speaking of fast food, let's talk now about my big grievance with uh, Davida and Fresenius. So here is the uh, Davida website. And this is just one of many recipes that they have on their website, Apple Crisp. They actually, DaVita actually is partnered with the American Diabetes Association. And you can see that uh, uh, one serving, which is a half cup. First of all, we know nobody's going to eat a half cup of something that's delicious. Has 47 grams of carbohydrates, all of which turn into sugar, which spikes the blood sugar, is going to spike the insulin, is going to cause inflammation, and is going to worsen kidney function. This is well established in the low carb nutrition literature. There is no arguing with this. If you're, if you're, especially if you're a diabetic and you're going to eat something like this, that's going to spike your blood sugar. You're basically destroying kidney function. Now, uh, Fresenius has similar recipes. Did it switch to the Fresenius website when I clicked that, or is it still showing DaVita? Still showing DaVita at this okay, point. Okay. All right. I've, I've got to do it a different way here. I've uh, you'll have to pardon me at my technology here. I'm okay. Let me, let me show you the other website. Way. Okay. Now let's show, let me show you the other website. This is for Cineus, And these are some of the recipes, uh, fruit bars, lemon, ginger, coconut cookies, cream, cheese, sugar cookies, uh, mm -hmm. berry, berry bread, pudding, mint, chocolate, brownie recipe. Every single one of these recipes is going to harm kidney function. Wow. Okay. So now you kind of you kind of see where you're looking at from the corporate end, and I'm looking at it from the low carb protects kidney function end. Literally, this would be like uh, the manager of your local McDonald's saying, Yeah, you don't need to eat meat and vegetables and cook at home. That's dumb. This ultra processed food we've got in our clinic, that's just as healthy. It's fine. And knowing that it's not fine. And so you, you can't tell me at the corporate level, at the boardroom level, they know that these recipes are harming kidney function. There's no way they can't know that. Uh, the only way they can not know that is just willful ignorance, willful blindness, not refusing to look. And so this is a huge, huge deal, in my opinion, that they are recommending foods to people with stage one, two, three, four, because everybody's going to go to their websites 
and say, oh, my God, I want to protect my kidney function. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes, of course. You go to the DeVita website. Oh, look, they're partnered with the American Diabetes Association. Oh, good. That's perfect. Right. Here. Oh, man, they've got a bunch of recipes here. Ooh, apple crisp. That sounds delicious. I'm going to make that tonight. You just harmed your kidney function. Just unbelievable. Yeah, the, the perverse incentives go on and on. Another example that came out of my research, but it's actually based on peer-reviewed research of other of scientists, of, of medical researchers. What happens to the number of people, the percentage of patients inscribed on the transplant list when one of the big corporations buys out a doctor practice? Mm. Every single time, well, every single time, no, but there's a substantial percentage, 10 to 15% decrease in the number of people who get sent for transplants. Now, why would that be? Um, I can only speculate. I do not know. I don't think that people are sitting, you know, toasting evil with martinis and smoking big cigars and saying, we're going to harm these people as much as we can. No, but the incentives are such that if you're really focused on the bottom line, you're going to think about cash flow. Sure. And where does your cash flow come from if you're working in dialysis? From dialysis patients. What happens to that person in the chair when they get a transplant? They leave. They right. are no longer your cash flow. So I don't know what is going on in people's minds. And I don't think, I don't want to go to the extreme of saying it's a conspiracy. Um, but something happens and it's predictable. And it has to do with, it points in the direction of financial incentives and financial perverse incentives in this case. So that's another situation. I don't know what's going on in people's minds when they recommend that kind of diet. I want not to think, oh, we're building a new cash flow of kidney failure patients. I do not want to go there. Um, right. But I don't, you know, it's problematic to, to have, I mean, based on your observation, based on your, um, you know, assessment of, of the unhealthiness of those foods, it's problematic. And again, it comes back to, you know, this thing of KT over B sounds like really complicated and stuff. I can, I can figure this stuff out. I don't know all the medical literature, but this is not too high tech. And yet a lot of people in the system are just told, do this, do that. I mean, I think there's a lot of dissatisfaction of people in this system from nephrologists straight on down to, to techs that they're not allowed to do what they signed on to do, which is medicine. <laughs> they are practicing according to strict rules laid down by the bean counters. This is the way I interpret my conver my many conversations, hundreds of conversations right. with people in the industry. They're sick of it, um, of being you know, kind of forced to, to follow the protocols. And, uh, and that's not what medicine is. And, and, you know, that whole notion of the Hippocratic Oath and the individual um, and, and tailoring treatment to individual um, bodies, uh, that's just not happening here. And I think, as I said before, uh, many of the, of the workers and the nephrologists are victims of this system as well. Let's talk about the whistleblowers that you talked with and that you're aware of in the dialysis industry. Uh, you document several of these in the book. Uh, how are so? Uh, I I was surprised. I figured the average whistleblower would be a uh, disgruntled person who is trying to stick it to the corporation, but that's not really the average whistleblower. The average whistleblower initially says, oh, my God, they, they read the research maybe and say, oh, my God, we should be dialyzing, dialyzing people slower and more gently. And they think, oh, my God, I need to take this to, to corporate leadership. They will be over the moon, uh, happy that we're going to we're going to improve our care. We're going to help these patients even more than we already are. And when they reach the, the corporate level saying, hey, we're doing this wrong, we should do this instead. What reward do they expect, do they usually get from the corporate structure? They, they often get a pink slip. <laughs> uh, they, they are not thanked for their observations because those observations uh, actually were well known to the, to the people who made the business model in the first place. I, time and time again, this is not just in dialysis, but elsewhere um, in many other industries, uh, the whistleblower starts off thinking, I'm going to save our company a huge embarrassment. I'm going to save, you know, bad PR and this. And, and in fact, um, they don't actually realize that this is part, this is baked in to, to, their, to their company's mission uh, from the start and all that stuff in their mission statement and values. That's all fluff. What really happens is a, is a, is a different set of rules, uh, the secret set of rules that people follow um, and that are signaled by the CFO, the CEO. 
Um, so in this case, I mean, I've talked with a number of whistleblowers, as you said, and one one fascinating guy, David Barbetta, he was in he was in the mergers and acquisitions um, area. And he again, he you know, he he started to when he started to to look at the valuations, he, st he started to think, wait, I think, you know, he, I think his first reaction, this is my interpretation, his first reaction was I can save our company from a real embarrassment here because there's a discrepancy between what we're buying at and what we're selling at, and that shouldn't happen. Um, and gradually, he was disabused of that idea that that, that that was accidental. I mean, and again, a lot of people were disgruntled, but only he spoke out, and he ended up filing a whistleblower suit um, against DeVita, and that was settled um, in, in, a court in, in a federal court in, in Denver um, for a, a, an amount north of $400 million. Um, so technically, DeVita did nothing wrong. Um, but the kickbacks to doctors, which is what he alleged this was all about, paying them more than market rate in order to incentivize them to send their patients in the future to these clinics, um, that was the, the nut of his, of his um, lawsuit. And, uh, you know, it's, he's not the only one who, who has alleged it, and he's not the only one who has brought suits to this. And uh, to this day, there are court cases in before the courts um, uh, with, you know, um, so... Another another fascinating whistleblower. He had grown up in Romania under uh, the socialist regime of Ceausescu, and he made he he as a teenager came to America, the land of freedom, the land of you know the land the opposite of this horrible dictatorship, and he went to work as a dialysis nurse, um, and he began to see in his corporation this weird sort of um, groupthink and again interpretive. Uh, a, a group dancing and call and response and these sort of weird religious signals and things. And he said, oh, my God, I left Romania to get away from this stuff. And here it is. My CEO is is preaching this. So it was an interesting um, observation, again, of the, of the way in which corporate culture can really inform um, the behavior of a lot of people, inform their morals. A lot of people, you know, your conscience is something you leave at home. I mean, you don't bring it to work. And your conscience, as, as someone famously said, your conscience in, in your workplace is what your boss tells you to do. Very it's often. Different, different from what, you, what your conscience is at church, at home, among friends, yep. at work. And, and if that's the way, that's the way things are, um, uh, you know, patients are going to suffer, but also the workers themselves ultimately are going to suffer burnout uh, and an untenable, untenable workplace. Absolutely. So anybody who's watched this interview and definitely anybody who's read your book, they're going to step back and say, this is a bunch of bullshit right here. How is this even what? How, uh, here's uh, Lisa. How do we change this? People are dying, literally not just dying, Lisa, but suffering for months and months and months and then dying prematurely. Yes, you're absolutely right. So Lisa's question, maybe the important, most important question that I ask you in this entire interview, what the hell do we do about this? How do we even begin as, as MDs and PhDs and just regular folks who have somebody going through this, the suffering that is dialysis, what the hell do we do about this? A really good question, Lisa, and really good question, Dr. Barry. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think that a number of the problems here are problems that are fixable. Um, that's the, the good news about this industry is it's very specific and first of all, 80% of patients should not be under the control of two corporations. The FTC has been asleep at the switch for 30 odd years while this was happening. Okay. And it better, I mean, economists who know a lot more about this than I do have written papers with catchy titles like How to Get Away with Merger and specifically about the dialysis industry. So, you know, let's go and 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 pay attention to what the laws and regulations are about market and consolidation, especially in a market where the patients are so tied to their local, um, you know, they, you can't go online and shop for a dialysis facility unless you happen to be lucky enough to treat at home. And many facilities won't offer the training for that. Um, so first of all, we need to have more entrance into the market. And that also means more tech, new technologies. Ultimately, this breakthrough technology in the 60s and 70s hasn't evolved since the 80s. They're still pretty much the same stuff. That should not happen. I mean, that, you know, we should do better for our patients. And, and part of the reason is there's a cash cow and two great big, <laughs> I don't know what the analogy would be, two big, big hot farmers milking it, and that's it. Uh, and so, you know, ultimately, we, we need more competition. 
Um, yeah. Remove the carve outs and the safe harbors from stark legislation. That's rubbish. Um, you know, at the end of the day, nephrologists, like other doctors, should be forbidden from owning, you know, profit sharing and stakes in their clinics where they refer patients. End of story. Um, I, you know, the regulation should be radically improved. So we need to do at the federal level and at the state level. I mean, the the I, in my view, from my reporting, the ESRD networks, which is the federal umbrella group of 18 organizations that theoretically, read, um, you know, oversees this industry, they've been hollowed out. They're, they're in it with, I know some noble exceptions, but I have never found them. Um, they're not doing their job. And the state, you know, survey, state after state after state complained to me, we don't have enough budget here to go to all the facilities, even the ones that we're required to go to every two, three, four years. Um, so better oversight, more competition. And then again, we've talked about some of the shortcomings of, of CMS, but CMS needs to fix its misaligned or downright perverse incentives. And they need to be measuring the time of, of treatment and reporting how long a treatment lasts for every patient in every facility, how high the UFR is, and docking folks who don't do it right, blood pump um, speed, blood flow rate. Um, these things are critical to patients' lives. These need to be measured by CMS. And then we need to talk about, if, is the bundle actually paying for uh, you know, proper care? Or is it just incentivizing corporations to lowball and cut yep. costs? And last but not least, home dialysis. It was a part of the original vision of Congress when Congress decided this isn't the American way, is taking care of people with this huge, um, you know, medical problem, but with a solution in hand. And we need to go back to the home dialysis model, individuals treating themselves and taking responsibility for their own health. And I think that I would love it if every healthcare provider in the United States read your book. You'd probably be okay with that too, but I'm talking about every okay practitioner every physician's assistant, every primary care uh, doctor, every family doctor, internal medicine, pediatrics, they all need to read this book. And then they can start to apply social pressure to their local dialysis clinic. Because you alluded to that it takes training. You can't just give a patient all, this, all the tubing and the needles and say, here, go home and self-dialyze at home. you got to train them how to do that. That is a trainable thing. There are people who do their own dialysis at home, but they're typically very, very motivated patients who just won't take no for an answer until they get that set up. Perhaps they've read your book or read some research that you talk about, and they know how much more comfortable it is to do it at home if you do it slower. They know that the side effects are much, much less. But I think if, if primary care doctors started saying, hey, I really want you to teach my patient how to do home dialysis to the nephrologist that owns the local clinic, the local dialysis clinic and say, no, 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 no. I didn't know. I do not want them on a two hour, three hour dialysis. No, I want you to train them. Either you can do an eight hour, 10 hour dialysis in your clinic. That's fine with me. Or you can train my patients how to do that at home. But that's that's the standard of care, in my opinion, as their primary care doctor. And I expect you to give my patients that I think that would go a long way. Enough enough primary care doctors saying that to the nephrologist, like we know you make more money when you do this in two or three or four hours. We get that. But also as, as this patient's doctor, I don't give a damn about your bottom line at all. Literally, no, I, I don't care at, uh, at all. What I care about is my patient being treated properly with state-of-the-art care and suffering as little as possible and living as long as possible. That's my goal. I suspect it's my patient's goals as well. <laughs> I expect you to do that for my patient doctor, nephrologist who owns the local DeVita or Fresenius clinic. That's what I expect of you. Uh, how do you think that would help? I, I think absolutely it would help. And you've hit another key aspect of this, and that is preventative medicine. I mean, another way of taking care of this problem, or at least re alleviating it, is to do the screening, the, 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 you know, most people, the majority of people who start dialysis crash into dialysis. They have no idea they have a problem until one day they wake up in the emergency room and, and someone sitting on the edge of bed saying, guess what? From now on, you're going to see me, a lot of me, because three times a week you're coming to our clinic. And that's a disaster. It's a disaster emotionally, physically, and everything else. But it's also a disaster just as a cold hearted look at this. It's financially, economically a disaster. We yeah. waste so much money doing this, right? And people should be doing the, the screening. They should be doing the, the Ozempics yeah. and the Wegovies and the, you know, the GLP-1 
inhibitors and uh, agonists, I should say, and SGLT2 inhibitors and other things. Primary care physicians should be doing this. Take it out of the hands of the nephrologist who may be incentivized to put people on dialysis even before they need it. Um, you're absolutely right that preventative medicine, and this is coming back to Lisa's question, um, preventative medicine is one of the key things. Um, just make dialysis obsolete to the extent possible. Absolutely, because there is a subset of patients who need dialysis, absolutely, <laughs> and are going to die if they don't get it. But there are so many, who, in my opinion, who are put on dialysis prematurely because a primary care doctor refers them to the dialysis clinic thinking, man, your kidney function is terrible. You better go ahead and establish a relationship. Don't tell me that that many of the doctors are like, yeah, she doesn't quite meet the criteria. We're going to tweak a little bit and then she will and then it'll be fine. We can go ahead and get her on dialysis. That happens all the time. And then they 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 do bazooka dialysis, which increases symptoms, shortens lifespan. They were giving too much epigen uh, that actually made the blood too concentrated and increased the risk of heart attack and stroke. All these things are happening every day, and it's all about the profit motive. And I think if we, uh, like uh, Mitzi says, educate, educate, educate. The more you educate the patients, but not just the patients, the techs, the nurses who are trying to do a good job in dialysis clinic, the primary care doctors, the nurse practitioners, the physician's assistants, all these people need to read your book. They need to understand what standard of care for dialysis, what is the goal uh, I don't. I think the average healthcare provider doesn't even understand that you can extend a, a dialysis patient's life and greatly diminish their symptoms if you do it low and slow at home. They they do not know that. Mm. Every time a, prim, a primary healthcare provider learns that, they're going to start applying pressure to the local dialysis clinic to get their patients educated. Uh, Dr. Muller, let me let me put your book, book up again. Everybody, please read this book or share it with somebody who needs to read it. How to Make a Killing. There's a link in the show notes. Uh, if people want to learn more about this, doctor, how can they find you? Um, I have a website, www.tommuller.co, um, not .com. Um, and, uh, I really would welcome people weighing in here and, and correcting me where they disagree with the book, um, giving me information about things that I've left out of the book, uh, further information. I've gotten, um, hundreds and hundreds of messages from people so far, and my education continues, um, in, in dialysis, but also this is a microcosm of our healthcare system, the financialization, the, the consolidation profits before patients, all of these things are familiar from private equity buyouts and these sort of things. I think this is an educational area. And I think the book does a pretty good job of laying out the, the microcosm of what's wrong with our healthcare. Yeah, I totally agree. Dr. Muller, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, everybody read How to Make a Killing, recommend it to your doctor, recommend it to a nurse that you know, everybody needs to read this book. Thank you, Dr. Muller. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Barry. It's been a pleasure.